on an excursion to Lesotho many years ago. And I stopped to show them the footprints of Messrs. Pondylus, beautifully preserved in the sandstone uh, just uh, beyond Leribi. But my civil engineering students were sitting up at the top of the double-decker bus that the excursion was in. I think some of you were there <laughs> drinking beer and you refused to come down and see the footprints <laughs> of Messer Spondylus. But there were a couple of geology students there on the excursion as well and they came <laughs> to see, um, didn't you, Joe? Yeah. Came to see the footprints beautifully preserved of this five-toed dinosaur. And that these dinosaurs had then been the lords of creation for more than a hundred million years. But, as you see in this reconstruction by Dick Finley, he has shown a volcanic eruption. Hmm? And was this the reason that the dinosaurs suddenly became extinct 65 million years ago? Or was it due to, yes, was it in fact due to the breakup of Gondwana land and this effusion of magma, molten lava and the toxic gases associated with those volcanic eruptions, was that what caused the extinction, the sudden extinction 65 million years ago of the lords of creation, the dinosaurs, or was it perhaps the other theory has it, that it was as a result of an impact of a asteroid, 10 kilometers in diameter, which collided with the planet Earth and set up such a fog of dust in the atmosphere that photosynthesis could no longer take place, the sun's uh, radiation could no longer meet the surface of the earth uh, and that that was possibly what caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. In fact, in the Caribbean Sea, the place of this impact has now been factually established. There was indeed uh, 65 million years ago uh, an impact of an enormous asteroid 10 kilometers in diameter uh, with our Earth. Anyway, the dinosaurs at that stage <coughs> snuffed it. And I believe they did so because they were so big and so greedy that there suddenly wasn't sufficient vegetation because of this asteroid impact or because of, well, whatever the cause. There just wasn't enough for them to eat. Thank goodness some of these little mammal-like reptiles that weren't so greedy, they had enough to eat and so they could survive and they did survive and they evolved. And here we are today to show that they did indeed evolve and were our ancestors. <laughs> Here we see the small mammal-like reptiles called Thrinoxodon, a direct ancestor to the mammals and to us. And it is now, ladies and gentlemen, the 30th of December. We're getting to the end, you'll be pleased to hear of this Earth story. And we see here in the foreground Civitherium a pre-giraffe. And we see a lot of other mammals there as well that had evolved by this time. But I wanted to highlight Civitherium because Civitherium was the precursor of the giraffe. And the Civitheria with the longer necks were able to survive the worst droughts by browsing on the leaves of the taller trees and so the 
Silvertherium evolved into the giraffe. So now, through the arrival of these living creatures with eyes and ears into its biosphere, the planet Earth had learned to breathe and see and hear and reproduce herself and nourish herself and heal herself. And it is now nearly the end of our Earth year, and the scene is set for the emergence of man. But not just yet, because... <laughs> the ape man, Australopithecus, here we see uh, the skull of Australopithecus robustus uh, from Stokefontein. It was on the 31st of December at 4 o'clock in the afternoon that this ancestor of ours, Australopithecus, arrived here in the Transvaal. <laughs> and uh, these ancestors of ours were not tool makers, but they were tool users. They used bone and stick and horn which is why Professor Raymond Dart gave their culture the name Osteodontokeratic culture, the bone, stick and thorn and horn culture. They used these as tools, but they didn't manufacture tools themselves. The first of the tool-making creatures were of our own genus Homo. They were Homo erectus one and a half million years ago. And here you see a group of them making fire. This is on the 31st of December at 21 hours 22. <laughs> and some of them made their way up through Africa into Europe where their remains have been found and have been named Neanderthal. The Neanderthal, here's a merry group of Neanderthalers having a party on their arrival in Europe. <laughs> And here we see a Neanderthaler. I told you by now they were making tools here. He's swinging his bowl of stones. He's going to have a go at the backside of that quacha that we see over there <laughs> on the left-hand side. And now is time for the arrival of Homo sapiens sapiens, uh, our own genus, our own uh, species. Here they are. I presume it's Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and another auntie or two, <laughs> arriving here 130,000 years ago. That is at 13 minutes uh, to midnight of our Earth year. And here we see a late Paleolithic hunter group. Of course, um, it's, I've chosen a group of Caucasoids. Uh, as our ancestors, because I imagined correctly that my audience tonight would be largely Caucasoid. I could easily equally have chosen a group of Mongoloids or Negroids, but anyway, here we are. Most of us are Caucasoids, and here is a group of our ancestors, our direct ancestors, uh, having a merry party and, 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 and posing very nicely for me to take their photograph. <laughs> This is a biogenic stone line. You see that layer of gravel just about, what, that geological pick is 300 millimeters, so this is about, about 900 millimeters below the surface is a layer of gravel, and below that is the decomposed granite. Uh, this um, is the sort of soil profile that one finds uh, in Santon. Uh, yeah. In, uh, if we were to dig a hole under this building, as was done for the foundations, that's the sort of soil profile that was exposed. And this was the sort of soil profile that existed on my five-acre plot that I've lived on for 38 years. And every time I dug a hole <coughs> to plant a tree, as it behoved me to do very often as president of the Tree Society in Southern Africa, 
I would examine this biogenic stone line. You see, the stone line has been produced by generations of termites who can only open their jaws two millimeters wide. So when they build their termitaries up on the surface, they carry up soil that is less than two millimeters in diameter. And anything larger than that gravitates down into the biogenic stone line, which eventually becomes a French drain that keeps their termitaries dry during the rainy season. But these termites have no respect for archaeology. <laughs> so any artifacts of whatever age there might be become undermined together with all of the other particles larger than two millimeters in diameter and these gravitate down into that biogenic stone line that which is a type of pebble marker uh, and in that five acre plot of mine from time to time every time I dig a hole to plant a tree I take a look in the biogenic stone line to see if there are any artifacts that have been left there by previous uh, inhabitants of that <laughs> five acres that I used to call my property because I held the title deeds. Indeed, I still hold the title deeds. Although if any of you would like to take them over, I'd be only too happy to sell. <laughs> yes. Yes, that five acres that I own still has been the home of human beings for more than a million years because some of the early Stone Age hand axes and cleavers uh, date back to nearly a million years and some of them of the early Stone Age and some of the Middle Stone Age flakes uh, and cutting tools we find um, also mixed up together with the early Stone Age. Some of the late Stone Age scraper tools and even the Iron Age. I even found this assegai head and quite a number of these uh, corn grinders all mixed up together by the termites in that biogenic stone line on my five acres <laughs> of this planet. Well, here's a prehistoric art studio and the fact that this ancestor of ours is expressing himself in forms of art that you see down in the bottom left hand corner, if you can see that far from where you're sitting, Benign creatures were these hominids living, we presume, in harmony with the rest of nature. And so, at last, through the arrival of man, the conscious creature, we told that because of the expression in art forms that these were self-conscious creatures, these ancestors of ours, planet Earth had become capable of thinking about herself just as you and I are thinking about ourselves right now. And at 16 and a half seconds to midnight of our Earth year, a singularly significant event in the history of our planet, the arrival on this planet of Christ, of Jesus Christ, at that particular time, and what an important uh, focal point in our history this was to be, these ancestors of ours obeyed the instruction to be fruitful and multiply, and by the year 1800, there were one billion of their species bestriding, bestriding this planet, and the industrial revolution was about to commence at one second to midnight of our Earth year, and that brings us to the present, to the era of our generation. So much for the history of our planet. Here we have, if we look at the present, we see a population growth curve. I started it here on the x-axis 
in the year 1450 AD. Because if I'd taken it right back to the beginning of our planet, or to the beginning of life on our planet, it would have been somewhere over in Ravonia um, that the graph would have had to stretch to. You know, when I arrived on this planet in 1927, there were five, there were two billion people, apart <coughs> from myself. There were another two thousand million people, two billion people in 1927. Today, there are five and a half billion people, just 27 years later. Eh? In other words, nearly, nearly three times as many people as there were when I arrived on this planet. And the prediction is that there will be about ten and a half billion people uh, in 30 or 40 years' time. So, there are lots of people on this planet and there have to be lots of houses on this planet uh, 